I'd love to introduce our next conversation that I know you all are ready for as well. Inclusion in cannabis. All right, so we have Shalice Rogers. Shalice Rogers, also known as Sister Rogers, the business auntie, is a first generation Caribbean American and native New Yorker with 13 years of experience in corporate financial accounting, management consulting, and government relations. As a strategist, her solution design firm supports overwhelmed cannabis businesses and business owners by uncomplicating the process of starting and growing their brand so they can clarify and convey their value propositions, develop actionable growth-oriented strategies, and plan their path to profitability. Her work centers on the co-development of systems, innovations, and processes that foster creative solutions inclusive of various sectors, communities, and ideas building inclusive, diverse, and equitable intersectionalities that catalyze positive social impact. So hello, Sister Rogers, the business auntie. Thank you for being here. Um, I'm happy to also introduce Miss Kindness B. Ramirez, who is an award-winning master educator and cannabis industry vet. Miss um, Kindness B. Ramirez leads with both her given name and a unique calling. Empowered with over 20 years of experience in the public education sector and a passionate desire to heal her community, Miss Kindness lends her skills to various projects in and around the cannabis space. In her role as the executive board president of This Is Jane Project, Ramirez supports women and non-binary trauma survivors gain access to plant medicine and valuable programming to foster healing. She is also a longtime community leader for women employed in cannabis and currently serves as adjunct faculty in the, in the Los Angeles Community College District, teaching non-credit courses in mathematics and science. Thank you so much. And today hosting this awesome conversation, we have our very own senior community and events manager, Rob. Thank you so much. And I'm gonna pass the mic to you all. I'm gonna get my notes ready because I'm super interested in this conversation. So thank you in advance. Thank you, Mariella, for the amazing introduction. And thank you, everyone, for tuning in today. What amazing talks we've had so far. Uh, so I definitely want to welcome our two amazing speakers. As I was telling them in the green room, one of the reasons why I really wanted to moderate this discussion is here in New York, we have uh, legalized cannabis and my small village and town in upstate New York just opted into dispensaries, though they did not opt into lounges. And just on Sunday, I signed a petition to try to overturn that ruling. And hopefully, I believe in November, they're hoping for a referendum to be on the uh, in part of the election to actually overturn that. But it's such an interesting topic right now. It's definitely a very fast growing uh, career path. And also, I think this is the time as we're in some of these early stages in many states of setting this up to also establish cannabis as a DEI focused industry and how can we support black lgbtqia plus women entrepreneurs in that sphere so welcome both for thank you for being part of this discussion and i kind of love to just kind of talk of course mariella gave great little bios for you both but you know i'd love to kind of hear a little bit more about you know yourselves where you're based in the world and a bit about your organizations and Ms. Kindness, I know you have COVID at the moment, so thank you so much for joining us today. So let's let's start with you. Thank you for that. Good morning. Good morning, Rob. Good morning, Shalise. And thank you for that beautiful introduction, uh, Mariella. Um, yes, I do have COVID, but I am not sick for the next hour. Um, Ms. Kindness Ramirez, yes, that really is my name. I feel like the bio was so thorough. I appreciate that. Um, What's special about me is that I was born an educator. I think I've been an educator for many lifetimes. In this one, it was my profession. And then in 2012, I suffered a bad injury and I used cannabis to heal my body. And then the universe said, now you're going to take that skill and you're going to apply it to this industry because they need it. The world needs it. And so um, in 2015, I started Club Kindness, which was a direct-to-consumer education firm where I was talking with other women and mothers about how cannabis can heal their bodies and the laws and the science and, and advocating. And, and then it just turned into this whole career for me of speaking and traveling and writing books and launching a CBD company and a new hair care line that communicates to 
the ethnic community about hemp and the medicine and connection and kinship and all of the possibilities. So um, yeah, I mean, that's me. I'm still teaching college part-time. I'm very, very busy. I have two children and still working in the community to do what I can to push legalization forward and teach how important and impactful this plant can be. Thank you. Well, thank you for being here. I'm super excited to dive a little deeper. And Jalise, I'd love to, you know, see any else that you can tell us about yourself. And also both of you are rocking some amazing Zoom backgrounds, like grade A professional. I love the wood paneling. I love all the art. Wonderful. Guys, um, I didn't get to say this to Miss Kindness in the green room, but like, yes. Um, I love seeing other black women specifically in cannabis and just like in different spaces. Um, so greetings to everyone and shout out to everyone present um, for investing in themselves today. My name is Shalise Rogers. I'm also known as Sister Rogers. Um, and I consider myself intentionally intersectional, um, like an, interse an intentionally intersectional human rights advocate. That's <laughs> better. I use cannabis as a Trojan horse to talk about different community issues and to talk about how the industry and the plant more specifically affects people's personal lives um, and how it also connects to the different ecosystems that make up our cities and our communities as well. And outside of that, I'm an accountant, so it doesn't even seem like it matches at all. But um, I run a small uh, firm called The Accounting Auntie, and that's where I help entrepreneurs and startups and small business owners. Uh, and I also am, I do a lot of things. But I'm a score mentor. I advise small business owners on their startups, on um, writing their business plans and how, and like all the different things that come with operations. And then I'm also affiliated with the National Black Chamber of Commerce. Um, and I'm currently the executive director of NYC Normal. And Normal is the national organization for the reform of marijuana laws. And so like outside of all of those things, what drives me to be in this industry is the community, is the innovation of the plant. So I'm excited to start talking about all of that stuff and hearing uh, Ms. Kindness's uh, views and experiences as well. Wonderful. And I love the idea of using cannabis as this Trojan horse, as you said, to talk about these other issues, which is great. Well, well great let's language. Talk I love that. Yes, yeah. totally. Well, let's let you know, talk a little bit too about, you know, what inspires you in the cannabis industry. So I'm curious, you know, what have you found inspiration from that? You've both touched a bit on, you know, some of your personal experiences and kind of, I guess, another way of also saying what inspires you is what are you hopeful for in the near future? Um, so Ms. Kindness, maybe we'll go back to you. Yeah, I know this is a great question um, because this is a tough industry. And so I've been, I'm in California and, and we were the first to legalize. And so I've been here through it all. I am post 40, I'm in my mid 40. So I've seen a lot of the evolution in the state and the changes in the minds of the people. And I'm inspired by that. I think as an educator, I'm inspired by the way people's minds can change as they receive more and more information and they have more lived experiences. So what really inspires me about cannabis now that I'm in it and I understand it and it's been 10, 12 years I've been in this industry and I see the potential, I'm inspired by that. How we can use this plant to really achieve health equity, how we can use this plant to essentially regain some of the wealth that was taken from our communities how we can use it to heal our bodies and our minds, how we can innovate, how we can change the planet. I mean, there are just so many things that inspire me about this plan. And if it wasn't all of those things, it also heals me. It's the reason I can walk today. It's the reason my mother's brain tumor is undetectable. It's the reason why so many of my loved ones are living pain-free today. And so if that's not enough, it's my commitment to ensuring that I teach as many people as I can the power of the plant, its access to wealth, its access to opportunity, and its access to healing before I go, before I leave this body and reincarnate, because I want, most importantly, my children to be able to make autonomous choices for their own health, um, in their life, in their career, and feel free to do that. So that, that keeps me working, it keeps me pushing, it keeps me taking risks, 
It keeps me public online as a cannabis consuming mother and an educator, a credentialed educator. That that spark, that 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 knowing that we can truly change the planet with this is what's most inspiring to me. Thank you so much. And yes. <laughs> agreed. 100% agreed. I've been saying that like uh, cannabis usage is ubiquitous, but cannabis innovation isn't. And cannabis has so many innovative qualities in the hemp fiber alone. There's hemp plastics, there's food, there's sustainable housing materials, there's fuel. And I think that the um, what inspires me is the the prospect of being able to celebrate an amazing plant and build green sustainable futures while investing in the very communities that the plant was weaponized against. And um, on top of that, I agree. I strongly, strongly, strongly agree. Like community brings forth networkability maybe. Um, maybe that's the way that I'll say it, like community and then maybe by extension, the networkability of the industry itself. And um, unlike many industries, and then even within this space as well, there are many industry veterans. I'm relatively new. I started in 2017, but I immediately noticed a convergence of people who had like minds. I noticed that um, it was very easy for people to find their tribe within this industry, and that there were people who had a similar vision, people who, um, it was not even always having a similar background because many of us had uh, or have different stories, different backgrounds, different, just we're diverse in ourselves as a cannabis community, whether it comes from um, getting into the industry by way of health, one's own health problems or family members or um, the fibers itself, whatever it is. I've realized that for me specifically, it's being able to connect with other like-minded people, finding social entrepreneurs and people who seek growth and expansion, not only in their professional lives, but in their personal lives as well. And people who care about facing the world as it is and strive to make it different and who want to utilize this industry and this plant to do that. How can we have a positive lasting effect using this plant? So yes, I agree. <laughs> You know, I, Shalise, I think I just found my new best friend, Rob. I just want to thank you for introducing me to my new best friend. And, <laughs> and if I can just add, you know, I, 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 I was a teacher before, but I didn't have a career until I entered Canada. Mm. And so, yeah, thank you for saying that, Shalise. Mm. I love that. And I love, the, I love we, teacher, accountant. I think that's the great thing about these emerging industries is that you can jump in without, you know, some of that other, you know, taking your other life experience and apply it to like these new industries. And sometimes I think that can be a hurdle for something that has been maybe long established, but I think that's the great thing about cannabis. And that's the great thing that we're kind of talking about a lot of uh, in a lot of our talks today is that entrepreneurship and that this, you know, taking, uh, you know, utilizing those past skills in these new fields, which I think is great. Um, and, that, you know, one thing that you were both mentioning a bit is on kind of the visibility element. And I think, you know, with cannabis, you know, whether this is true or not, it, it seems like, at least in the public perception, that it is a field dominated by white men. And I think for me, there's always that feel when you see posters now, it's starting to always to go to that beer commercial world where it's mm. definitely advocating towards a, a, a straight white man. So I'm curious, you know, despite, you know, we of course have these amazing leaders like yourselves in this industry. So how can we work to eradicating this gap, you know, both like in the structure and also kind of the more public perception of cannabis? You know, I think if, if it, can, it means continuing what we're doing, to be frank, like there, but there's no going back. So it's more of this. It's, it's finding more outlets like this. We were talking in the green room about how I'm, I'm excited to wake up and do talks where I'm not speaking to the choir. I'm not preaching to the cannabis community because frankly, we know that's why we're here. It's who doesn't know that we need to reach or the curious that we need to reach or even the deniers. 
Those are, those are my favorite ones, the deniers, because we get an opportunity to ask them what they do know and then meet them where they are and then reform them through better education. So I think, you know, yeah, we're seeing the same thing. Cannabis is a microcosm of the US, right? I mean, everything that we were built on placed white men, white straight men, and I don't even know that I, the, the term straight, but cisgender white men at the front of everything, right? They, they run it all. And so that's, that's something we're gonna continue to battle. We're gonna continue to battle it until we don't have to anymore. That's the reality. When that will be, I don't know. What we need to keep doing is being louder, is being more vocal, is being more present is showing that there are teachers with, with children doing this, right? There are accountants in New York who have who, who use their voice and use cannabis as a Trojan horse while also doing wonderful mathematics and keeping our books clean, right? That's how we normalize by just being ourselves, showing up as who we are and showing that we use cannabis. I blow people's minds every day when I enter a space I come in as a professional. I talk as an educator. I'm the president of This Is Jane Project. I do all of these things. And then I pull out a pre-roll. And they're like, wait, what's going on? Is that, what is that? Is that, is that oh my God, how, how can you do that? And so right then I've opened a conversation. I've started to destigmatize and show them that these are professionals. And so succinctly I'll say more, more, more of what we're doing. I agree. It's platforms like Power to Fly, which I am grateful for as well, and being able to talk about cannabis and non-cannabis spaces, which is what Ms. Kindness is alluding to. Like The more that we are able to um, redefine for people visually and then also like in all these other uh, in all these other ways, kind of like what does a cannabis consumer look like? people have a very specific view of what that looks like in their heads. And especially when it comes to people of color within this industry, um, it's not just, we have so many different barrier, barriers, but then even just like being in our bodies and choosing con to consume <laughs> is like one, one huge hurdle at least because many people are within the cannabis closet. So being able to um, speak about uh, speak about cannabis on a public platform um, in, in ways that go beyond consumption. Um, I would also say mm, uh, it's interesting because Ms. Kynes brought up this point and then like my brain just went into a whole different direction. I uh, similarly, I brought cannabis to my church. So I used to be a youth pastor. And when they <laughs> made me their youth pastor, I sat down with leadership and was like, we need to discuss a couple of things because I don't want to I don't want the leadership of the church to find out about what I do within cannabis from like a quote in a newspaper or like something crazy and, and abstract. And I wanted to be able to introduce cannabis to my church. So I brought, um, I went on a fact finding mission in, in um, I think it's called Nevada. The locals call it Nevada. Whoa. But anyway, um, I went on fact finding mission in Nevada with a couple of government officials. And then I brought home like this, um, this one to one THC to CBD salve. And then I like got those little Sephora takeaway containers, like those little lipstick situations. And then I just like dosed them out in there because lots of black churches, their communities are made up of older Black women who often are working in fields like nursing or who have lots of um, arthritis or different types of pains and aches all over their body. And I realized that the huge, the biggest hurdle, um, at least in being able to talk to the community and people who are like the naysayers about cannabis is changing the way that they think and feel about it because they already have a perception of cannabis when they, when you know, you even start the conversation. So you have to change the approach of how they even feel about it. My way of doing that with my church at the time was by bringing topicals and then having, I, I had the church leadership pray over it. I was like, do whatever you, you guys need to do in this moment. But I wanna be able to talk about this openly, um, to have the parents not be afraid, especially being the youth pastor there. And then also um, just being able to like, expand once again, what does a cannabis consumer, a cannabis advocate, or someone who works in the cannabis industry look like and do? I, and in addition, I um, 
I also agree that it's continuing to do what we already do. I prioritize working with the people that I already know within the industry, new people that I meet. And there are so many of us, but so few of us at the same time. But we find ways to work together. We find ways um, to work together towards outcomes that benefit communities, that create opportunities for people to learn, for people to network, for people to be put on, for people to advance their goals. And like I said, the, the cannabis community is one of my favorite parts of about the industry itself. So being pulled into the community and being able to find your network, you're probably going to find a co-founder. You're going to be able to find people up along the supply chain if you're making a product to be able to help you with that. Like the networking within it and then you'll find like so many people are so chill that you can kind of visibly tell the difference between the white men in suits who are only approaching this industry as a cash grab and the people who are intentionally a part of this industry who may utilize the plant for whatever various reasons or who just want to see a sustainable future being built use a lot utilizing plants like that's pretty mm -hmm. much it so I love that. And I love the phrase cannabis closet. I That's definitely going to stick with me because as a member of the LGBTQIA plus community, I can certainly see some similarities there in just coming out of the closet and, and then expose, you know, just bringing it open into the open and starting those conversations that way, I think is amazing. See, it's even the same. I'm sorry to cut you off, Rob, but it's even oh, yeah. the same when it comes to legislation. So um, mm -hmm. having to advance gay marriage in, in the legislative mm -hmm. and just in public policy was such a feat and it was it's the same thing that we're going through when it comes to legalizing cannabis whether on a state level or on a federal level there's so many people who have so many thoughts and feelings on it and it becomes a, mm -hmm. a conversation that is less about what it what we're asking for and then like what everybody else's preconceived notions or goals or like what it is that they want out of the yeah. industry and the plant well, that's a great question also that Joseph had in the chat where Joseph's asking a little bit about the um, still the fact that it is illegal in many places. So what what would either of you recommend to do to focus on getting it legalized on a federal level? What can people who are listening to this do? This is my favorite, favorite topic, because that is where I got heavily involved in cannabis in the beginning. It was in policy. I, I joked earlier, like maybe one day I'll run for office, but it's true. I think what people need to do is literally start where they are. So you said federal legalization, but that's that's scary. That's very scary when you don't even know where to start. So the safest place to start is right in your city. It's right with your city council. It's frankly right with your school board. It's doing things like what Shalice just talked about. It's talking to your church community about it, right? It's asking questions right around you. Googling cannabis community groups near me or normal near me, right? And ORML, right? Which Shalice talked about earlier. It's going to the city council asking, do we have any plans to legalize cannabis around us? Attending town halls. I got my position teaching college because the community college president was so progressive that she invited a group of cannabis professionals on to do a town hall for the students. And that was teaching, it was a union uh, worker, it was a lawyer, actually my attorney, myself, a business leader, all from LA, and we went onto the campus and we talked to the students about the industry, right? How you could enter, what's legal. And as a result of it, the dean said, I want you to come and teach for me. Now, then I was really passionate. Okay, well, I'll come and teach for you, but we're going to bring programs on this campus and we're going to funnel these students into jobs, just like we do with LAX and our construction program. And when I went to talk to the board, I was met with all of the schemas, all of the constructs that they had in their mind about cannabis. Now, mind you, I'm in Los Angeles. Let me remind everyone where I teach is in South Central Los Angeles. So the board of our college is actually a lot of older conservative black men, same stereotypes, same opposition, same naysayer mentality because of maybe a different ideology, same fear, I will say, but for different reasons because they then see, well, my nephew was in prison for this. My cousin had this, my whatever, whatever. So those schemas are what we're really working to break down. 
And we have to start right where we are. We have to first educate ourselves, ask a lot of questions, start right in our little local community, and then watch that fire spread. The big voices, the people doing the work, they're ready to take the torch to go to national. They will, but they're going to need these small teams underneath them when they go. And so I think it's really important to frame it that way, not scare people about legalization. Start right where you are. I agree. Um, looking up online, who's my local representative? <laughs> Just first step, because many people don't, and it's not, it's no shade, no tea. It's, it's not um, necessarily uh, calling people out for not knowing this information. It's just that people are tend to be in the bubble of their everyday lives. And once again, it's about how all of these issues, whether it's cannabis or another public policy issue like voting, how it changes the way people think and feel about their, the impact that they can have. So if they already are like tapping out mentally, then where there's, um, there's other areas that we have to address. And I agree that education is key. And that's something that I've found time and time again, every single year to the point that at this point, I'm just, I recorded recently the same things that I say, because I'm just like, I'm just going to keep saying the same things. <laughs> Nothing's going to change about what I'm saying. But um, another note on education as well. Uh, okay, so first I'll go through this. Yes, looking up your local legislators, um, trying to find people who are like-minded, trying to see if there's a local normal, if there isn't one, um, starting one. And even if it's not normal, starting your own local cannabis meetup or your own local cannabis group, your own local cannabis or like online Facebook group or something, like build community with people because you are not the only person in that area who's either interested in cannabis, consuming cannabis, utilizing cannabis, for or, some, sure. or something or like sure. so connect with those people and then be able and then start to just like network whether that be in person utilizing linkedin or other types of online platforms to be able to um, to, to find them um, seeking out virtual conferences like power to fly or cannabis related conferences to be able to learn about what's going on and that way you can find what it is that you want to do within the industry, finding your specific ikagi, your why. Why are you here and why do you want to apply what it is that you are here to do as a human being to this industry, utilizing it as like a conduit, <laughs> the same way I utilize it as a Trojan horse. Um, yeah. And then being able, and then from there, um, yeah, I feel like building community and then just starting with like, who are my local elected officials? Is there a community board that I can like sit in on a meeting on? Because mm -hmm. we are still in this virtual format, it's actually even easier to access a lot of these like local town halls or little community yes. board sessions and everything. And those people, whether you believe it or not, they they are driving a lot of things that happen within your community because they have a lot of the times a direct ear of legislators. Yes. They're working with them on a day-to-day -day <laughs> basis, sometimes a yes. monthly basis, just a very frequent basis. Um, so there's that, but then I want to touch again on education and I don't know how people don't feel <laughs> about what it is that I got to say, but, um, I think, <laughs> Go ahead. Go ahead. I think like this is education is also how we continue to create more opportunity and inclusion in cannabis for people of color because ignorance actually, uh, oh, snap. <laughs> We, we can, can hear, hear you, you though, though still. Yes. Yeah, but they didn't they didn't want that message to show. You see that? <laughs> I know. That's, that was okay. Listen, and I was gonna say, I thought Mercury retrograde was over, but she was about to preach and then that happened. Okay. <laughs> oh my goodness. So, I mean, I'm not sure how she wanted to wrap up, but I definitely agree that Am education I back? is key. Yes. Oh yeah, she's back. Ahead. She's back. Okay. <laughs> Like literally as soon as I was like, oh word, that's how, that's how you feel. That's how you feel. Um, sorry, everything adjusted a bit, whatever. What matters is like making sure that I get my, <laughs> my point across to everyone here. Um, I believe that ignorance is more costly to black communities than the state of um, this, than the state that they live in could ever be. Is it still cutting out? No, we can hear you. No, keep going. Yes. Okay, but can you hear Harry Potter in the background? I'm so sorry. Copyright. <laughs> You're all good. Um, so yes, uh, it, the 
there's so much ignorance caused within Black communities because of a lack of education. And that's not necessarily like even talking about elitism with colleges and all that other stuff, but just education about what's going on in their local communities, how, um, how, how elected officials are on a day-to-day -day basis making making plans, making um, amendments to things that affect their everyday lives. And it's hard to get people to care mm -hmm. about that when A, they don't think it's real or they mm -hmm. don't see how, once again, it affects mm -hmm. them. But, um, and that's why I was saying that ignorance itself can then be more harmful than state sanctioned violence probably yes. can even ever be. Yes. This industry is yes. so new, unique and it ties back to your question about like what also inspires me about this industry, which is another thing that Ms. Kindness also um, spoke about. America owes a, a promise and it owes a debt to many Black people and it mm -hmm. also owes a debt to Indigenous people as well, to Indigenous tribes. And the disinherited of this land, many of them currently live in redlined districts and communities experiencing the consequences of over policing over a plant that states are now utilizing the tax proceeds from to plug budget deficits that come from the mismanaged funds that they yes. were doing that's further exasperated by Rona. So many black families are separated and so many community members are taken out of their out of their local economies because of cannabis. So I think it's important that we continue to center people and data because we have data, very real recent data showing how over policing, how many people mm -hmm. were over policed, the races, of, the races, the age range, the credit scores, the zip codes of people who were over policed. And I'm just saying that America needs to owe us back like they owe their tax. And so we're going to utilize the can at least I think it's incumbent upon many of us who are talking about inclusion within cannabis to to then broaden this um, the scope of like what reparative justice can look like for communities and not just black communities, um, Latinx communities, LGBT. TQIA plus communities because we are mm -hmm. intersectional as a people. Yes. And that's I, know, I, I need that. my church lady fan. I need my church lady <laughs> fan because it's hot. I don't know if that's the COVID yes. fever or if that's the preaching. I, I just want a little to bit of everything, really right? <laughs> If I can't um, really yeah, quick, like, Rob, I think I, continuing to educate and changes like and like I said, changing the way that people think and feel about cannabis as a whole, when we when we draw, which is something that like I do in my work is drawing the intersections between how the industry and other existing factors affect mm -hmm. child care. Cannabis, mm -hmm. cannabis legalization affects in, um, employment opportunities. Ms. Kindness was just talking about that. Immigration, mm -hmm. transportation, housing, child care, mm -hmm. access to locally grown food. Like it, yep. if these are things that yes. already are <laughs> problems <laughs> and that already exist, even people um, taking up their their civic right to vote, mm -hmm. like all of these are existing problems, and cannabis intersects with them. And maybe we can utilize how like sexy cannabis is as a topic and as a yes. conversation to push public policy <laughs> efforts forward that intersect with these other areas, like housing, like immigration, mm -hmm. like right, childcare. Right. Well, I I, I, I think, definitely. You know, sorry, I do, I know oh, we're we're a few <laughs> minutes over, so I do have to wrap yeah. us up. But I, I definitely love this idea of using this cannabis as a Trojan horse, getting out of your cannabis closet. There's so many great learnings I had here. So many questions we didn't get to. So, you know, we'll definitely have to have you both back so we can tackle these topics further. And now that you're best friends, you know, I know that will be very easy to do. Um, so we'll definitely share, you know, more information about getting in touch with you both. Uh, in our post-event blog post that everyone's going to receive. But I just wanted to thank you both so much for this conversation. I'm walking away with so many things. And thank you also for all of your work in this industry. I just got smarter. Thank you so much for the opportunity. I appreciate you, Shalif. I'm going to be in touch, girl. 